Right, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gents. Um, I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. I'd like to welcome you. Colin and I would like to welcome you to this pre-FOMC webcast. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Colin. Um, on Wednesday, the 16th of December, and the last FOMC meeting of 2015. Before we get started, I'd like to acquaint you all with the risk warning. So anything that you um, hear on this webinar is um, for information purposes only, and anything that you hear should not be taken as a personal recommendation. So here we are, end of 2015, and I cast my mind back 12 months and I recall a conversation. You know where I'm going with this, don't you, Colin? I recall a conversation I had <laughs> with you, Colin, about um, you know what to expect from 2015. And you know, we we both thought. I think we both thought, to be fair to you, we both thought that it, the Fed would find it difficult to tighten policy at a time when essentially central banks around the world were starting or, or still still in full-blown easing mode. I just think you probably overestimated the ability of the Fed to actually deliver on its dot plot charts, whereas I was yeah. a lot more sceptical about the dot plot charts per se and I think a little bit unfairly compared them to um, a dartboard where basically um, Fed policymakers took a guess as to where they thought the Fed funds rate would be in a year's time and just threw a dart at it. Um, to be quite honest, you know, you know it's not I, that far off because they don't have any recourse for uh, for being wrong. So it's, in a lot of ways, it is. I mean, it's their, their guess is as good as anybody else. I guess is the uh, the bottom line on the dot plot. Very true. Anyways, but I, continue. But I, but I would I would suggest that you know you and I in the markets probably have a much better um, so, you know insight into what's going on in the markets than say um, 17 central bankers stuck in a room. Um, I think the Federal Reserve Board and Federal Reserve policymakers can be very introspective when it comes to the U.S. economy. So, mm -hmm. so obviously, what we're going to do, ladies and gents, is Colin and I are going to look at the likelihood or otherwise of the Fed disappointing tonight in the same way that they did in September. And I've got to say, despite the fact that I don't think um, they should hike, I think the likelihood is that they will. Um, certainly on the, on the data alone, I don't think they should be hiking. Um, certainly if you compare it to the September data and the Fed is data dependent, the Fed is potentially hiking at a time when the data, quality, the data that we're seeing is actually weaker than it was in September. Um, obviously the labor market data has improved somewhat, but we have come off the back of a couple of fairly lackluster readings um, in September and October. Um, but you, you put that down to the fact that people were expecting a rate rise and didn't get one. Um, nonetheless, I think what we're really, I think the base case scenario for today is that we're going to get 25 basis points, and then really it's a question of how many, how many rises do we get in 2016? Now, Absolutely. You, Maybe I could just pick up from here, Michael, on the yeah. uh, on the Fed and their um, sure. jam, and then we can talk about 2016. Absolutely. So Michael's right. Absolutely. When we go back three months ago, the data was a lot better, no question about it. The Fed should have raised rates in September. The reason the Fed didn't raise rates in September was because they were worried about a budget crisis hitting in October and November. And we saw we did get it. The Republicans pushed their speaker out, out, out of his job. They, uh, they eventually got themselves into a, into a deal with Democrats that has been, been, been perpetuated by a bunch of stopgap measures. But that was the, the political side was, what, uh, was one of the things that held the Fed off back in in, uh, in September, and, and Michael's right, some of the data's gotten better, some of the data's gotten worse, and now the Fed's in a jam because they've been telling everybody pretty much for the last six weeks, they've been hinting they're going to raise interest rates. And when they did that back in the summer, and uh, and then they didn't, the market went down. And the problem is that now that you've hinted this, that uh, if, the, if they don't do it, then people are going to go, well, what's wrong with the economy? The uh, Dudley and Yellen, two of the big three of the Fed, have been going around saying, well, you know, uh, a, a rate hike is a, is a positive thing. It's a 
sign from the Fed that we have confidence in the U.S. economy. Well, if they suddenly don't raise rates, then people are going to say, well, maybe you don't have confidence in the economy, and we can watch the stock market had, uh, could head a lot lower. So that's where I think we're, uh, we're at an issue. And then so now what's important is, is that odds are they're, they're probably going to have to raise rates because they signaled it in, in the uh, – the negative impact of, of not raising rates at this time could be bigger in some ways than the, uh, than the impact of, of raising rates. So I think they'll do it today, but then I think they're going to bend over backwards to say that we're not going to raise rates again and they'll be for, more dovish for 2016. So maybe we can start to look ahead, because I think now the statement, the press conference, and the – actually, I don't think the dot plot as much, because I think it's going to come down there. They're, mm. too, uh, they're too hawkish in my opinion. But let's go on those three, Michael, and we can discuss. Okay, so how are the how the so basically what, so, so what do we what do we got to focus on is first and foremost the decision. The decision comes out 7 p.m. UK time. That's uh, 2 p.m. US time. So the decision really is a question of if they hike, do they hike by the 25 basis points that the markets think that they will, and if they do, how do they then manage the message going forward? Because I think if they don't manage expectations lower, then I think you're going to get an expectation that you're going to get two or three rate hikes next year. And t to my mind, that's balmy. I just do not see how you can hike rates at a, part, at a time when the U.S. manufacturing sector is in recession. We've just seen U.S. industrial production slide 0.6 percent in November. And October was revised down to minus 0.4. You've got the ISM manufacturing index down in contraction territory. The last time the Fed um, uh, moved on monetary policy when manufacturing was in recession was when they launched QE1. So they were actually easing policy the last time the manufacturing sector was in recession. So it does go back to the dot plots, but I think it – so what you're going to have is a situation whereby the Fed is going to hike, but at the same time they're going to revise down their inflation forecasts and their GDP yeah. forecasts, which to my mind is completely counterintuitive. You look at the CPI numbers that we got um, yesterday, and the CPI numbers were coming in at 2%, and we saw CPI month on month, or was it year on year, of 0.5%, um, which begs the question, where are we seeing this inflation when you've got oil prices, and we'll look at oil prices right now, which are down. Since the last Fed meeting, this is, the last Fed meeting was the end of October, so that's this candle here. Let me just bring, blow this up for you, ladies and gents. So this was the last Fed meeting, end of October. Since then, we've come down over another 20%. If you look at U.S. gasoline prices, it's a similar sort of story. Um, let me see if I can find the gasoline chart. We've got the Bloomberg Commodities Index, which is trading at levels last seen in 1998. So here, here's October. I think gasoline prices are a little bit lower than they were at the end of October. Not overly much, but still lower. Natural gas prices are lower. So cost of living is that much lower, yet inflation in the U.S. is picking up. Why? Quite simple, Obamacare. Physician fees went up. Rental fees went up. So, so you've got inflation in the U.S., but it's on – it's on essentials, if you like, which is health care insurance and what have you, which people really don't have a choice about buying. So can you, can you honestly argue that that's a significant recovery? I'm not sure that you can. Here in the UK, we don't have that in our CPI number, which is why our CPI is at zero and which is why the Fed's is not. And yet we've got the Bank of England um, looking to keep rates unchanged while the Fed has got itself into a jam and is essentially hiking rates so it can cut them again. I think that's probably what it's trying to do. So we so what does this what does this mean for the dollar and what does it mean for stock markets? And I think you've got a view on this, Colin, and you think whatever happens and I happen to agree with it, whatever the Fed does, unless they're ultra hawkish, the dollar will go down. 
I agree because I, I feel that the Fed, that the market, I'm, the U.S. dollar has gone up over 20% over the last year as a basket against, against world currencies. And I think that's part of the reason why we're seeing things like manufacturing slowing and, uh, and, and, and the discussion of, well, how much of this, this slowdown is because people have been anticipating for so long that the Fed's going to raise rates. Because tapering ended over a year ago now, and it's been a long time people have been expecting the Fed to start rates. Main Street has had more than enough time to respond, and, and the U.S. dollar has certainly done so. I think the U.S. dollar has peaked, and I think the U.S. Do the US dollar has priced in a much more aggressive rate hike campaign than we're going to get. And I'm going to mention briefly the dot plot. When you look at the dot plot, there's about 14 members ha have, uh, have put their numbers in. About six of them, about basically about half of them have put in numbers calling for essentially two to four rate hikes next year, and half of them are above four. So I, odds are when you look at the dot plot today, you're going to see that come down pretty substantially. And, uh, but I think the market expectations are there as well. I think the, the U.S. dollar has peaked, and I think the one thing we will find with the, the Fed increase is they're going to bend over backwards to say that you know, this is not going to be a, a program of 12 consecutive, the next 12 meetings they're going to raise rates like they did in the, uh, in the last cycle. You know, is, it, is it one and done? Is it two and done or three and done? I mean, my feeling is that they've got to get themselves back up to about 1%. That's what the Bank of Canada did in 2010. They went from 0.5 to 1%, and then this year when the, when the oil plunge hit, then they went back to 0.5 five years later. And, and history and shows that's that was what a mistake, though, Colin, wasn't it? History shows that Sorry? was a mistake. History shows that was a bit of a mistake, though, wasn't it? Well, no, I mean, the, uh, look, it was perfectly fine for the economy for five years when they mm. got caught with the oil price plunged, right? right? I mean, they didn't okay. do it. They cut rates when the oil price collapsed. So it wasn't mm. because of monetary policy or anything. It was the right move. It was that they got hit by the uh, external factors. So mm. just to continue on the uh, – so the dot plot, I think, is going to come down. I think you're going to see them bend over backwards to say that um, – to say that, you know, we're not going to raise rates right away. It's going to be slow. It's going to be gradual. And, and interestingly, I think you and I have both looked at the, um, the speech from uh, Governor Brainerd. As, uh, but you've looked at her more short term, and I've looked at what she said more long, uh, with a longer term perspective. And she gave a speech uh, about three weeks ago that basically talked down expectations for the long term hikes, where she was saying the, the previous neutral rate for for interest rates was around two two and a quarter percent. This cycle, it's more likely to be one to one and a quarter percent. So, and I agree with her, and I think that uh, that so that's why I, I've said I think you'll get three hikes in. Uh, in 2016, I think that that's my limit also, though. That's the high end. I think that's a maximum you're going to get in 2016, and I think anybody who's calling for more is, is, is way too aggressive, and that's going to come down. I know you, I know, I Michael, you're lower than me. What's I think that? three is pretty, I think three is pretty aggressive. Yeah, I know. That's why I say it's the high end of what I'm thinking. Yeah. I've been with the three, and I still, I went with three, and I think you'd agree on one. You probably get me to stretch to one, um, yeah. and, and there, there, you know I have very good reasons for thinking that. Um, mm -hmm. First and foremost is that in the second half of next year, the Fed is unlikely to move simply because of the presidential election and mm -hmm. um, you know uncertainty surrounding that, particularly if the candidates don't change um, on the Republican yeah. ticket, because I think if the Republican ticket continues to carry Donald Trump then I think a lot of investors are going to get very, very concerned about the U.S. economy. And I think that's going to make it much more difficult for the Fed to tighten. So if the Fed is going to tighten next year, then really um, there, there's only sort of they need to do it early, and it's going to be in the first part of next year. And how many how many meetings does the Fed have in the first half of 2016? I think it's four. Um, four. One in January, one in March, one in April, and one in June. April and June. Yeah, so when I called for three, and my feeling is why I say it's the aggressive end, is because I, I base that on a, a hike in March, a hike in June, and a hike in December. The hike in mm. December could easily get knocked off. That's, uh, the, and, and, and to be honest, you may only end up with one of the two hikes in the first half, depending on mm. how, uh, how things go. But that, that's, the, that's what the kind of plan I've gone with now. And I've said I left out September on purpose because th they won't do it in September and they won't do it in October because that's when the main election campaign is underway after the conventions and before the vote. So those two meetings are out for sure. The and they are open, in, but I'm yeah. iffy. And they yeah. only generally hike when there's a press conference, so they don't have to. But generally, if you're, if you're guiding, then 
a press conference is the best way to articulate a move because yeah. if you if you move on a meeting without a press conference and you schedule a press conference, everyone's going to know what you're up to. Yeah, exactly. And that's so, why I went with March and June, which are press conference meetings. Hmm. You know, which suggests to me two of the, you know, but then again, we had this conversation last year and I didn't think that they would hike this year at all. So, mm. um, looks like I was only two weeks out. But having, having yeah, said that. Yeah, an excellent call. I mean, having said that, I'm looking at the data. If you looked at the data in isolation, irrespective of all the noise surrounding it, would you, and you looked at it, would you say the Fed was going to hike today? And I would suggest, looking at the data, if it had happened at any other time during this year, the Fed wouldn't be hiking. The only reason the Fed are hiking is because they've back, backed themselves into a corner, and if they don't, they'll look weak. So, Yes, I agree with you on that. The, and that's why, the, yeah, the negative signal of not hiking is worse than the actual hike. Yeah. At this so point, let's, so they've so just got to do it and get it over with. Yeah. So basically, it's like pulling off a band-aid. They got to do it quickly. Um, so yeah. for me, really, it's a question of where are the key levels that we need to keep an eye out for um, in in the wake of the decision tonight. Of course, they could they could hike by only an eighth, or mm -hmm. they could remove the lower bound. There are other. There are yeah, I think both of those are, are, are certainly possibilities. My concern would be that if they did it, I, I mean they could, and then they could say that you know they've done what they've done. My concern with that would be just that I think the market's expecting a quarter point, and I suspect oh, yeah, anything no. less totally, would, be, but I, uh, would be problematic for stocks. I think I think what we've got to what we've got to look for here is will, will it be a unanimous decision? If it's not a unanimous decision, how will the markets react? If it's, say, for example, a 5-5, five, five, say it's a 6-4 split, um, how, does, how, does, how does the market react to that? If it's a 7-3 split, who are, the most, who are the policy makers who are most likely to dissent? For me, it's Brainerd, yes. Tarullo, and Evans. Yes. And if, can I add to that, Michael, that of those, if, if Evans dissents, the, the, I mean, the, he's been dubbed for a long time. He's a regional, regional Fed president who's rolling off uh, after this meeting. And, and mm. so I don't think people would concern too much about Evans. But, mm. but Trullo and Brainerd being permanent governors, I think yeah. would, uh, people would take notice if they dissent. I think so, too. And, you know, yeah. to be quite honest, I would find it hypocritical for, you know, Brainerd and Trullo to be so articulate in terms of pushing back on a rate hike to then acquiesce to it. So for me, I don't think there's yeah, anything Yeah, it's a funny one with the permanent governors because sometimes they, they, they seem to, uh, usually when they talk, they then vote with the party line, so it's, it's a funny one there. I, that's why I say if they do dissent, I think that people will definitely stand up and take some notice. Mm. So I think the voting patterns will be important, certainly in the context of the overall mm -hmm. decision. Um, okay, so that brings us on to basically the charts, and I've, I've done a couple of videos in the past couple of weeks with respect to obviously the surprise ECB decision, um, and I think obviously the ECB decision has given the Fed room to move. I think that was part and parcel of why the, the ECB were as little bit wishy-washy as they were. Um, so, so what does that mean for euro dollar going forward? Well, certainly if we look at the weekly charts, and this is something that's got me a little bit concerned, we've got a bullish weekly reversal here, um, and, we've, and we've also got a daily reversal. We're back above 108.20, which was the previous support. Um, if we change the candle back to a daily, you may have noticed that yesterday we got a key day reversal. Um, which was significant, certainly in the context of reversing, you know, closing below the lows of the last two days. But in the context of the bullish weekly reversal, I think we could get a move back to 108.20. I would be concerned for the upward scenario in the euro if we push back below 108. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, we do have significant resistance between 110.40 and 110.50, which is where we have the 100 and 200 day moving averages, and that's what's capped every single rally thus far, one, two, three. So I think the weaker side at the moment is probably for a drift back lower. 
if we like, like, wouldn't be unusual. I mean, that was a massive, massive rally that we had off of that 105 base, and mm. uh, you know, certainly with, with that kind of a move, then you know you don't back and fill that in a couple of days. And a, a retest of that 10820 wouldn't be unusual. But more than mm. that, if you started busting 108, I think would be would be problematic. And I'm just looking here at your um, stochastics and seeing that it has gotten a little bit overbought there, and mm. you could see that roll back down. So that also would suggest a retest. Yeah, it would. Um, but what's what's most interesting about this chart here is this 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 purple line here, which the candle in early December, the very strong upward candle that we saw in December on Thursday, the first Thursday when the ECB met, um, that's the trend line from the all-time lows in 2002. That trend line comes in and cuts that line right there. Wow. So that level there is huge. It's massive. If we break below 105, that breaks the uptrend line, that the, the uptrend that the euro's been in since it made those 82.30 lows in 2002. So don't underestimate the importance of where we are right now. Now, the ECB doesn't want a significantly higher euro, but by the same token, the U.S. Fed doesn't want a significantly stronger dollar. So something has to give. And given the state of the U.S. manufacturing sector, I think the, the dollar, given the, given the direction of travel, um, they won't want the dollar index much above 100, which is basically where it was at the beginning of the month. And that was certainly an early indication there. So we're at a very, very key level in terms of the euro against the dollar. And why are we looking at the euro against the dollar relative to the dollar index? Because the euro makes up around about 57% of the dollar index. So there is a good correlation between the two. Furthermore, go on, you, did you want to say something, Colin? Oh, I was just going to say the rally up off 105 for the euro and that successful test also coincided with the peak of the uh, U.S. dollar index where it just bumped up yeah. above 100 briefly and then rolled mm. down. And I think you're right. I think there's a massive, going to be a massive wall of resistance at the at the 100 level for the dollar index. And I think, well, I mentioned before, I think the U.S. dollar is now probably peaked and it's, it'd probably see it start to work its way down and the euro work its way back up a little bit. And yeah, gold, I let's think do gold. To bring that up, gold. I think let's gold will be a big trader today as well on this. Let's look and at gold because, because what happened... A couple of weeks ago in the wake of the ECB hold was we posted a, a key reversal week on gold. And yeah, we have struggled to rally significantly, but we're still above the 2010 lows at 1044. Um, so what we don't want to see here is a fall below them. But furthermore, what we've got here is a little bit of a, an oversold situation on the um, weekly stochastic. It is starting to turn positive, but it's not positive yet. So certainly it's not a strong signal. Um, what we want to see on gold is for it to break above the 1,100 level, but what we don't want to happen to undermine a bullish scenario or a rebound scenario is for it to drop below the open of this candle here, which posted the reversal in the wake of the, uh, the ECB move, or the, you know, the move two to three weeks ago, which when yeah, we saw I've a significant been, uh, rebound. I've been telling people when I do my weekly gold outlook that uh, that you can't rule out a uh, a trip down to a thousand dollars on gold because you've gotten so close to it. It's just a big psychological level that's been sitting out there, drawing gold towards it. But realistically, with the U.S. dollar peaking and the way the euro has been acting, and as Michael's been saying, the way this is bottoming out here, as far as I'm concerned, if we don't see a thousand dollar gold within probably today or within say the next couple of days, we're probably not going to see the thousand dollar gold anymore. Gold does look like it's base building. I've been calling 1,000 the washout scenario, but uh, and or the shakeout. But if you don't get that, gold is gold. Otherwise, looks like it's base building and and should start to trend higher as the U.S. dollar starts to uh, starts to come lower. The question is, do you get that washout or not? And the longer it takes, the less likely we'll get it. But at the moment, we are we are still trending down. So there is no evidence yes. that we are going to rebound. That first evidence will come if we break above 1,100. There's also a significant key level on Brent. I sort of touched upon it a little bit earlier when I brought up the Brent chart. But let's bring up the Brent daily chart now because that also suggests that we might see a little bit of a rebound here. So if we look at the daily candle chart here, 
That lower line that I've drawn uh, through the lows there actually coincides with the lows that we saw all the way back in 2008 here. You can see that there. So direction of travel, key direction of travel, it is very much towards the downside. We can see that quite clearly on the monthly chart. We can also see it fairly plainly on the weekly chart. But let's look at the daily chart. And the daily chart, look at how long that shadow is there. Um, that suggests that the market's worried about being overly short. Yes, we're still in a downtrend, but certainly in the context of where we are and where we've been, oil is cheap. That's not to say that I'd be tempted to buy it at these levels, but the risk reward would suggest that there's potentially more upside in buying it than there is in selling it based on the historical price action, simply because we're above long-term support on, on Brent crude. And the fact that we didn't stay very long down near that $36 a barrel mark on Brent. So I would be overly cautious about buying into the hyperbole around 20 or $25 a barrel oil. We're already there on 20 or $25 a barrel oil in other grades. Just because we're not there on Brent doesn't mean that we'll get there. Yeah. And it's all about trading the price action. The price action here is telling me be cautious about going short oil because you're very near a very, very key support level and the potential for a short squeeze is very, very high. Yes, and could I talk to that with uh, WTI, Michael? You can. So we had WTI has come down and retested 34 to 35, which was right around the 2008 lows. It went, it dipped below it briefly and then has bounced back nicely and it has been on the rebound. We're showing oversold on the stochastics, but I do get a lot of calls from people, particularly journalists asking me, so Colin, what do you think about $25 oil? And, and people have tossed that number out there and I said, well, if you were to break 30, you'd probably drop into the 20 to 30 area. Where you end up, who knows, right? And, and because what you'd probably have is a big flush out of stop losses, a big plunge down, and then you'd probably see it come back. So what level it actually ends up bouncing off of would be hard to say. But the point is, if you saw oil go down, it would probably not, below the 35, and, and particularly if it went under 30, you would not see it stay down there very long. You would probably see it bounce back up into this 35 area again. And, and then I guess the other part, which we'll, we can discuss, we'll be discussing for a long time to come, is, is what's going to happen for the long term. And even with this uh, supply war that they have, we will get, we can get short squeezes and, and, and nice pops and nice rallies and certainly something we want to be, be watching for. But I, I think also that the days of the $100 oil are, uh, are are going to be uh, are pretty much gone for uh, for the next several years, but I think we will get some trading swings in oil, and that's something we want to be able to take advantage of as traders is to watch for when are we oversold and when can we get a pop. But when we get a pop, don't think this is the beginning of a new bull market in oil. Look for the point of when do we then take our profits and then and then trade the next swing. And I think that's the approach we want to be taking to crude for really for the next several years. Yeah, I suppose in the context of your comment that we'll never see a hundred dollar oil again. Um, obviously, a oh, lot well, not of that. Not five to ten years. <laughs> yeah. Um, in terms of what could cause that, I mean, barring any geopolitical shocks, I would add as a, yes, a rider to that statement because if the Middle East goes up in flames, then, then I would suggest all, then all bets are off because a lot of the oil producing countries um, are in the yep. Middle East and at the moment they're suffering as a result of low oil prices and if that continues then it's going to be much more difficult for these countries to look after the poorer elements of their population. There's going to be potential for an awful lot more discontent and as such it, the region which is unstable enough as it is has the potential to become even more unstable, irrespective of whether or not Iran's oil comes onto an already oversupplied market. So, yeah, but if the fundamentals stay the same, absolutely no reason for oil prices to go back to $100 a barrel. 
but as we all know, fundamentals can change very, very quickly. And Absolutely. I'm minded to wind my, wind my memory back to around about five years ago when people were talking about peak oil just before the shale revolution <laughs> took off. And people were talking $130, $140 a barrel. Now we're $100 a barrel below that. So, you know, and it, it was only just over a year ago that you had the Scottish Parliament as they were pushing for independence saying $110 a barrel, yeah, that's fine, it'll be there for quite some time to come. And now their fiscal plans are in tatters and they're having to re completely rethink um, everything they knew about oil prices and their potential income stream. So just because something looks obvious doesn't necessarily mean it will continue to be the case. And um, we just had some latest inventories come out for crude, a huge build of 4.8 million barrels. We were expecting a draw of 1.5 million barrels. So let's just see what West Texas does on the back of that. No surprise there, a quick spike lower. But I don't think that's really too much of a surprise. Um, so that, that's your oil prices. Also, I think if you're looking at copper prices, there's a similar sort of story playing out. This $2 a ton level is very, very key in the context of where we go to next. And this is where we were very, very oversold on copper um, at the end of November. And we've, we've worked out that overbought scenario, but look the way that we've over look the way we've over worked it out. We've pretty much gone sideways. We haven't rallied that much. You know, and I think this is a concern. When we look at a chart and it's oversold and it starts to rally, it doesn't need to rally particularly hard to become less overbought. It just needs to trade sideways. So you know, it's important to bear that in mind when you look at the fundamentals and you look for a rebound. Two dollars a barrel, we struggle to even go not two dollars a barrel, two dollars Ton. We struggle to get much above, or an ounce rather. We just we struggle to get much above 210. So we haven't really gone that far. Um, iron ore again. This looks very very weak. Unfortunately, I don't have a chart. But Sam Walsh, the chair of Rio Tinto, said that $30 a ton for um, iron ore when it was around about 55 was in the realms of fantasy land. Well, it's been as low as 38. So um, that fantasy land could soon very very quickly become a nightmare for Rio Tinto and BHP, who are pretty much the last men standing when it comes to the big global commodity providers, Glencore, Anglo-American, they've all been in the news for all the wrong reasons. And I think that's another reason why I think we, when we're talking about significant rate hikes, the Fed is going to be constrained by the fact that there's an awful lot of leverage out there in the mining and commodity sector and a lot of miners, a lot of mining companies and basic resource companies will find even a modest rise in interest rates are very, very painful. Yeah, I think that will be the case for a lot of uh, a lot of them, and especially with all the uh, the money that the Fed has pumped into the uh, into the system, and 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 that's going to be a whole other uh, conversation that they're going to have to have eventually is what do they do about their balance sheet? But but for now, I think they're just focused on interest rates. They pretty much all said that you know, they're not going to do anything about their balance sheet for a uh, a long time after they start raising rates, and we saw how long it's taken them just to start raising rates. So. Indeed. So let's look at the FTSE 100, the UK 100, because we saw a bit of a breakdown earlier this week or the end of last week, um, below that 60-50 level. Um, but we were unable to take out the lows that we saw in August, but we actually stopped on a nice little trend line um, just below 5,900. Now, what's important about that trend line? Well, should we have a look, ladies and gentlemen, because I actually stumbled across this quite by accident. And if we basically take it from the 2009 lows, look where that trend line comes in. Right on the money from where we rebounded earlier this week. So a big, big level on the FTSE 100, trend line support from the lows 2009 at a very, very key level. What we want to do now on the FTSE to confirm that we've got a bit of a base in is to 
really regain a foothold above 6050, 6050, um, push on back to around about 6300. But to be quite honest, I don't think we're really going anywhere on the FTSE at the moment. We can go back to 6450, 6450 was 61.8 of this decline from the peaks that we saw in April to the lows that we saw in August. So at the moment we're in a little bit of a range. We're probably nearer to the bottom end of the range than the top, but ultimately I think it's going to take something pretty substantial to push the FTSE lower. Um, but if we do break below the lows that we saw in August, then we could go quite a bit lower. And that, that's the big concern, I think. So what's next? Let's look yeah. at the S&P because I think that's going to be quite important as well. S&P again, yeah. that, 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 that 1995, 2100 level, again, we've, we, we dropped very sharply in December and we've had a little bit of a rebound. Again, it's not surprising. We're running into the 200-day moving average, so we really need to get back above that. That level is round about 2065, 2070. It's round about that peak there. So if we get back above 2070, then we'll go and have a little run at this trend line resistance from the July peaks at 2137. So again, looking at good. both. The, oh, sorry. I go on. Oh, I was just going to say, looking at the patterns on both the S&P and, and the FTSE, I, I think it's quite interesting because we are seeing some retests of support, which is encouraging. We might stay range bound in the in the near term, but uh, but so far markets do look like they're they're mostly just uh, digesting the moves up we had back in uh, back in October. But we'll see if that's able to hold. RSI is kind of down, or, or sorry, stochastics down about their previous low. The stochastics on the FTSE were oversold, so we are getting a nice trading bounce here. But at this point, we're still kind of range bound. Looking at, at more at more of a swing trading at this point in time, and we need to, when we whichever way we go out of this range, I think will be quite significant. But at this point, we're still range bound on both. Go ahead, Michael. Yep. No, that's I mean that's pretty much you've just articulated my thought processes. It's a similar sort of story on the Germany 30, the DAX. Again, we're rebounding from an oversold position. Um, what was significant about this particular rebound here was that um, we rallied from 9,300, came back from the peaks at the end of November, hit 61.8 retracement pretty much on the money, and have now come back. So now really it's just a question of where we go to next. Let me get rid of that line because we no longer need it. But certainly in the context of where we've come from, um, that I think there's going to be a significant amount of resistance, roughly a little bit higher than that probably, around about 10,600, and obviously the 50-day the moving average. But again, it's a similar sort of story. We've got this trend line coming in from the lows. If I take the chart all the way out, we're looking at the 2011 lows, so it's a little bit more long term. But certainly if you look at the structure of this particular move, if this if this is a wave one, I mean, it could, this could be an actual an ABC, but I don't think it is. I think this is a wave one. If this is a wave two, then this could be potentially a wave three back down again. Um, I mean, I'm not a big fan of Elliott Wave, I've got to say. Um, and certainly if you draw a line through here, there's certainly plenty of resistance up at 11,400. Um, and the current rebound could take us all the way back to 10,800 and the previous FIB level of around about 50%. So again, there's nothing conclusive here. You look at the weekly chart, the weekly chart is overbought and trending lower but the daily chart is oversold and trending higher, or looking to trend higher. So what you've got here is a little bit of a mixed message. To me, it suggests we'll get a little bit of a rebound, or maybe even a bit of a sideways trend between here and here, and then a fresh move lower. Yeah, I think you're right with that. It's hard to see how much they, that you can get a trading bounce here, but uh, but when it's oversold, overbought on the weekly, it's hard to see how far it's going to get on the bounce. That's the thing, and I think I think a lot will depend on the euro. If the euro rebounds strongly, then that's going to weigh on the DAX and vice yeah. versa. If the euro looks weak, then that will be fairly supportive of the DAX. If the euro starts to rebound, then that actually could weigh down on the DAX because a weak euro is good for German exporters, and they need all the help they can get at the moment, particularly with the fact that their two biggest markets, China um, and to a lesser extent Japan, 
are, 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 are showing some signs of weakness or have been showing some signs of weakness. So so there's that. And there's, then there's, of course, our old favorite, the Chinese, the Chinese currency, which if it continues to decline, though it has actually come, enjoyed a little bit of a bounce back um, in recent days, but it's at five-year lows. Chinese currency. China need a weaker currency. That that step that they took at the end of last week to create a basket, four to one, I think, is another way for them to weaken the currency because, particularly mm -hmm. against the euro and against the Japanese yen, they have been hurt by the fact that it's been pegged to the dollar, which meant, which is, which has meant essentially that um, the decline that we've seen in euro dollar from 140 to 104 has really hurt Chinese exporters because it's also hurt the, the euro has also declined against the Chinese one as well and that's why their export data has looked so weak and it's the same token against the Japanese yen the two biggest money printers of the last three years have been the ECB and the Bank of Japan they've got the three the two weakest currencies and that's hurt China because of their peg with the dollar they need to loosen that peg and they will loosen that peg and become more freely floating the Chinese one will weaken. That could reinforce deflationary pressures across the globe and as such keep inflation low. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that the uh, that particularly the the yuan's performance against the euro and against the yen, because it's been dragged higher with the U.S. dollar, is, is a real problem for them, and it's probably one of the reasons why their economy has been slowing so much and underperforming over the last. Uh, over the so last year or, two, year or two, and, uh, and yeah, so no question about it. They need to, uh, they need to weaken, and I think that that move away from the U.S. dollar towards a basket would be uh, would be something that they really need to do because they're uh, they're getting killed with the U.S. dollar. No, even if the U.S. dollar comes off and they come down a little bit, they need to come down a lot because uh, the the U.S. the uh, the export sector of China is a much bigger chunk of their economy than the export sector of the United States, and the U.S. is struggling enough as it is. You can just imagine it's flattened them. Mm. And if you look at the euro against the Chinese or MNMB, it's down around about yeah. 14, 15 percent. So that gives you an indication of the squeeze to margins for Chinese exporters by the fact the euro is 15 percent weaker against the RMB, 20 percent weaker against the U.S. dollar since 2014. Yeah. Okay, L ladies and gents, do any of you have any questions, anything that you'd like Colin and myself to go over that we haven't already covered? Do you want me to cover the Canadian dollar, Colin, or do you want to cover the Canadian dollar in the sure, wake of those? Sure, let's talk about the Canadian dollar while we're waiting for questions. Oh, oh, my word. The loonies had a massive, massive run up here. It's up into the pretty. high 130s. No, it's, I mean it's it's been tracking to the, for the most part it's been tracking the oil prices as oil and the, as as the U.S. dollar has gone up and the uh, price of oil and the Canadian dollar have gone down. So dollar cad of course has exploded to the upside. It's in a big uptrend. It is really overbought and getting due for a correction. If we see uh, so what's the, the two things that could turn around dollar cad? One is the U.S. dollar comes down or the price of oil rebounds. Uh, if the price of oil can, uh, was, to, was to sink again, that sends the dollar cat higher. If the U.S. dollar starts to come down, that can that can bring it down. So you might get a correction back to this uh, this recent breakout point, which is I can't read that. Is it around 136? No, that's uh, 134. 134.57. The 134.50 was yeah. the previous high. Yeah. Yeah. And we are getting a, a negative divergence with the uh, with the stochastics there at the bottom. You are getting lower highs in the stochastics higher highs in the pair. So at some point we'll get a, re a reversal. Does it start today with the Fed? Do we get a relentless march at buck forty, and then, and then it peaks out and comes down? It's, it's hard to say at this point because it's in an uptrend. It looks like it's ready for a correction, but who knows when we're actually going to get it. When we do, though, as we saw with the euro and as we saw with crude oil, that when these markets get overextended, you, the snapback rallies can be pretty, pretty quick. So it isn't something you'd want to be looking at, at going long here either. It's a matter of what do you, if you're long, you want to be looking at where do you take profits, and if you're short, and if you're looking at going short, you'd be looking at where do we, uh, where do you want to try and take advantage of the correction. But uh, at the same time, if you try too soon, you could get run over by a steamroller. So it's a, uh, it's kind of a hard one to call here. Two words: euro, dollar. Fourth of December. Yeah. 
105 to 109 in the space of a day. That gives you an indication yeah. of of how the market can suddenly turn on a dime and come back and bite you very, very hard. Um, so, yeah, I mean, absolutely. You certainly look at these two dojis here. I suggest there's a lot of indecision. That weak draw number is pushing it higher. The big level is 139.89, 139.90. That's the 2004 lows Canadian dollar, 2004 highs US dollar against the Canada. So that's the next, that's the next key resistance level. Um, just been asked if we've gone over the Germany 30 yet. We have done, but we can more than we can, we can go over it again if you so choose. Um, let's have a look quickly. Just quick preamble: Germany 30 or the DAX. We talked about the 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level of this move here. It's now looking potentially, I think, a little bit overbought. Sorry, oversold. It's starting to look as if it's going to tick a little bit higher. But overall, I don't really see it rallying much above 10,800 between these two lines here. And, and, and overall, I think it's very difficult to pick a direction for it. I think we're probably going to range trade between the lows that we saw earlier this week and, those, and, uh, and the peaks that we saw um, on Friday of last week, around about 10,600, 10,700. Another reason why I think that the euro could be um, due a rebound is this chart that I covered in a video a couple of weeks ago, and that's the German two-year. Um, look at the reversal on that bad boy. Again, that was ECB day, a nice reversal. But look at the reversal on the weekly chart. We basically wiped out the gains of, this is the weekly chart, we wiped out the gains of one, two, three, four, five, five weeks in one day. So I would not expect to see this go higher, given the fact that the ECB generally doesn't buy bonds with a yield of less than 0.3%. Currently, the two-year, German two-year, is above my, or below minus 0.3%. Thus, I would suspect that if European economic data continues to improve, this will start to drift lower. And as a result, we could see yields start to drift higher back towards zero. That should be um, euro supportive, assuming, of course, that Mrs. Yellen tonight isn't hawkish. And that's really the big unknown. We don't know that. We don't know the answer to that question yet. Okie dokie. Is there anything else that um, you guys would like us to cover? Because if not, that's it for this year. Uh, we won't be doing any webinars um, now until 2016 when we do non-farm payrolls on the 9th of, is it the 8th or the 9th of January? First Friday and first... It's the 8th. First, it's the 8th, is it? 8th of January. Yeah. 8th of January. So, um, unless there's anything else, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for your time and your support this year. Hope you all have a great Christmas and New Year, and hopefully you make lots of money if you choose to trade over the, uh, um, the FOMC. Um, if, you, if you choose to trade over the FOMC meeting uh, tonight, I would caution against that. I'm going to be sitting on my hands <laughs> and wait until all the uh, noise settles down and then decide. I think in the first few minutes after you get the report, though, you're probably going to see some pretty sharp swings in both directions before people figure out what it really means. I think it'll be about 12 hours before people figure out what it really means. Because they'll look at the dot plots, they'll look at the descents, if there are any, and then they'll look at the, for the forecasts for inflation and GDP, and then try and draw a conclusion as to how likely any more rate hikes are. Yeah. That won't happen in the next. It won't, that won't happen in an hour. So there you have it. Yeah, no, you're right. I think markets will be active for probably right through the uh, right through into the weekend, almost. Yeah, yeah and then Sorry, it'll be put, uh, and then that'll, tomorrow. Yeah, and then that'll probably be it until January. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks, ladies and gents. Um, we have recorded this, so if there's any part of it you want to listen back. But this should be up within the next 24 hours. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you for your time today and uh, wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thanks, everyone. Happy trading and Merry Christmas.